Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming online. Um, yeah, so I'm James Breen. I'm a, a vet. Um, I'm still in practice, uh, well, nominally, uh, one day a fortnight, trying to be a proper vet still. Uh, but essentially, half my time belongs to the University of Nottingham. Um, and we have a research partnership with AHDB. And part of the research partnership is, is particularly for lameness and mastitis. And with the latter, uh, we've been developing uh, a new scheme for mastitis control in the UK. Um, and this has now been termed Quarter Pro. Uh, we've recently been doing some workshops around the UK um, with the assistance of Rachel, Ian and Tracy. You can see the names at the bottom of the screen there. Um, working with small groups of farmers, showing them the patent tool, using their data. And we've done some evening seminars with vets as well. Um, and uh, Quarter Pro was officially launched at Dairy Tech uh, yesterday. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to use this and interested to hear your thoughts afterwards. Right. OK, so we're going to run through the Quarter Pro initiative. Um, like I say, there's uh, lots of people involved here. So uh, Derek's led very much at AHDB, Andrew and Catherine at QMS, myself, Pete and Martin at, at Nottingham particularly, and then other vets as well, as you can see there, Rach, um, Tracy, and then Ian from the, the dairy group. Really what I'd like to do this evening, as well as introducing this scheme, is run you through and actually do it live. Um, the Quarter Pro scheme, step one, three steps. Step one, uh, we're going to use the milk recording and clinical mastitis data from our clients to predict the predominant pattern of infection in the herd. Um, and we're very keen to show this and we've, we've worked with farmers as well. So I know we've got a very mixed audience this evening. So, um, you know, we hope that farmers will be able to do this as well, but I, I'd really like vets and advisors to be um, sitting with farmers and doing it together. Um, and in order to uh, facilitate this, uh, we've come up with a pattern analysis tool so we can convert the data very rapidly. And the pattern analysis tool gives us an answer in inverted commas uh, in seconds. So we can predict the pattern. Once we know the pattern, step two is then we can direct our mastitis control measures uh, according to this pattern. And uh, we've uh, tried to sort of drop out some of the key findings from research um, around the mastitis control plan. I know some of you online tonight are um, very familiar with the mastitis control plan work. So some of these resources are sort of fact sheet type um, uh, things that uh, have some of the key information you might need. Um, you know, for example, if your pattern is very much environmental infection from the dry period, well, then we need to direct control measures in this area and what sort of things can we come up with. And step three, then we're going to repeat this process every three months, quarterly, quarter pro, and we're going to optimise mastitis control. So we, we obviously, with, with other areas of herd health, whether you're monitoring 21 day preg rate, you know, cell count patterns, whatever, you know, it's important that we keep doing this. And roughly every three months is quite a good discipline to get into. Um, even in smaller herds, you know, you'd accrue enough data over a three month period to see if the pattern was changing and to modify control measures accordingly. OK, so uh, where we tend to come from, I suppose, is you, you could ask the question, why is mastitis still important? We list lots of reasons and we, we talk about this with groups of farmers and we talk about cost. Um, but not always, of course, and, and we recognise that, that, that mastitis is important in other areas as well. And farmers talk to us about welfare, you know, Farm Animal Welfare Council, talk about the, the two key endemic diseases of cattle, lameness and mastitis, very important from a welfare point of view. And we talk about milk quality, we talk about sustainability, future of food and farming with the Foresight Report, for example, and wastage from herds with culling cows with chronic mastitis and high cell count, and, and we're throwing milk away. But I do want to highlight the antibiotic uh, agenda and prudent, responsible use, because of course that's come front and center in recent years. And off the back of the O'Neill report, where it's talked about tackling antimicrobial resistance, well, you sort of bore you to tears with this, I know, you know a lot of you have heard this before, but ag antibiotics in agriculture, reducing unnecessary use and really point out the unnecessary use and of course this is where you know you can um, apply this to mastitis control in dairy herds and also it's important for us as the government then responded to the O'Neill report government have very much said that they want livestock sector specific targets and that these are going to be underpinned 
by improvements in husbandry and disease prevention. So, you know, we are going down this route and it's important that we work with farmers, our clients to enable this. As you know, and hopefully you've had a chance to talk um, to your clients about this, vets and advisors who are listening this evening, Rumour Task Force at the end of 2017, livestock specific targets and the dairy sector, you know, obviously then has its own targets. And these targets were six uh, things around reducing antibiotic use in dairy herds. And of course, as a group, uh, you know, at Nottingham, uh, you know, we sat up because four of these six directly relate to mastitis and mastitis treatment and control. If we think about intramammary use, dry cow, lactating cow, sealants, direct, uh, you know, role there with mastitis. But also you could argue injectable use, critically important antibiotics, and overall milligram use, mastitis will also impact on these as well. I know a lot of you have then been using the antimicrobial use calculator uh, that we designed um, as part of the research partnership with AHDB. And this is migrated across now to the new AHDB website. You'll still find it here. And I know a lot of you have used this and, and I hope you find it useful. Um, if, if you don't know about it, then please do have a go. It's all drop down driven, so you can collate 12 months worth of antibiotic use in a dairy herd, and we can plug in how many mills and then how many tubes uh, and things like that. And we can feed back to our clients. So this is a herd in Gloucestershire, for example, and we get the three key metrics up here in the blue box, milligram per population corrected unit. And this herd is at 29 milligram. So that would be quite high. And DDD is the daily dosage. So define daily dose. In other words, on average, each cow in the herd is exposed to treatment with antibiotic for nearly six days in a year. And again, that would be a little bit high. And then define course dose. So each cow in the herd has on average two courses of antibiotic in a year. But the, the really nice thing about this is, of course, we can look at where the antibiotics are being used. And for example, if we're worried about the milligram use in this herd at 29, well, we can look down to the list and, and perhaps you wouldn't be surprised now, you, this has been talked about a bit, that the injectable antibiotics, so here the penicillin is half the milligram use. And we can start talking about perhaps when and in what situations would we use injectable antibiotic. So we can start to benchmark our clients. And this is important increasingly now for Red Tractor uh, and others where we need to be doing this. And then we can compare to lots of other herds, for example, and we could start to see where herds are using antibiotic. And this was work done by Bobby Hyde. You can get to this vet record paper from 2017, where a lot of the rumor targets were based on some sales data from 2015. Now, of course, we, we've looked at over 350 herds and looked at what they're using, either from databases on farm or from what their vet practices have sold them. And for example, if you line up 350 herds in terms of increasing milligram use, you see this actually quite nice in a way that we can demonstrate a lot of herds are below the 21 milligram target for the end of this year. And quite a lot of herds doing very well. But there's this significant pod of herds out here that are 30, 40, 50 milligram and above. And when we started looking at what these herds are doing, there were some things around blanket use. Um, you know, particularly things around blanket use of injectables. And we know that mastitis was involved in some of these things. So we can summarize by saying, well, all the other things that mean mastitis remains an important consideration as an endemic disease in herds for cost and welfare and sustainability issues. We know mastitis is so important in terms of driving antibiotic use for a lot of herds, but for several different reasons. If we think about tube use, lactating and dry cow tubes, well, they take up a lot of your daily doses and courses respectively. So if our daily doses is high, that can often be driven by clinical mastitis treatments and intramammary tube use. If we're looking at milligrams, we know that injectable antibiotics are still often used and we're quite happy to have the conversations. We would use the word inappropriately. We know that a lot of herds still inject mild and moderate clinical mastitis cases, recurrences, they inject with systemic antibiotic. 
and often this isn't required but it takes up a significant amount of milligram so that influences that metric and this one i mean perhaps less so now if we're honest you know perhaps less so now but for a, a long while critically important antibiotics the kefquinones for example were used to treat mastitis um, perhaps less so uh, currently and, and of course it's been shown that you don't really need those in many situations so here we go with why mastitis is important for antibiotic use. So, of course, when we thought about this post rumor publications at the end of 2017, say, so, well, how would we reduce antibiotic use rather than in through improved mastitis control? And there's three main ways, and, and you're know, keen to sort of hear what you think. You probably know one way, and this gets a lot of press and a lot of attention at the moment. There are schools of thought and some research out there that suggests that perhaps we just don't need to treat some clinical mastitis cases with antibiotic as a group we we tend to advise caution in this area the original research out of the us is very much around if you know your mild clinical mastitis case is caused by e coli so this infers that there's some on farm culture and that we differentiate e coli away from environmental streps, staphs, Klebsiella, and you know, but of course what we know is perhaps some herds are going down the route of just not treating mild clinical cases with antibiotic full stop. Um, and we, we would advise some caution here in the belief that it reduces antibiotic use. And of course it will reduce daily doses, but if milligram use is your issue, well, it doesn't really impact on milligram use. So we tend not to go down that route. We could certainly talk about modifying approaches to treatment. For example, antibiotic dry care therapy in low cell count cows, you know, plenty of research evidence to show that this isn't required. And a lot of herds now moving to a selective approach. And also, we would also suggest that unless a cow is clinically unwell, the use of a systemic antibiotic with a mastitis event is not required. So there's some ways we can modify approaches to reduce antibiotic use. But those of you that you know, obviously know the group well, and we've talked to a lot of you over the years, the main way we reduce antibiotic use through improved mastitis control is avoiding the need to treat in the first place. So it's all about reducing the new cases, all about reducing new cases. And I know the conversation is often around how do we deal with recurrences? What should we be doing when new cases turn up? Yes. You know, we can have those conversations, but we'd rather new cases didn't turn up very often. And can we control these? For many years, of course, we had a recognized approach with the Dairy Co, as it was, AHDB Dairy, then Mastitis Control Plan. And we still hold this up as the gold standard approach. Um, but we'd like to talk about perhaps a, a more widely available scheme, a new initiative, Quarter Pro as a route to working with our clients and for farmers to avoid the need to treat by reducing new cases. So when we talk about mastitis control then, if we say, well, what's new in mastitis control? Because it's quite a lot. If you think sort of the last 20 years, um, Andrew Bradley, Martin Green published this in the vet record, the changing face of mastitis control. You can get to this as a, as a nice little sort of summary of a lot of things. But essentially, if we think 20 years ago, the role of the dry period was study so some some uk work that showed the impact of intramammary infection during the dry period and that drives mastitis events in the next lactation of course this remains very important for some herds the mastitis control plan work takes us as far back as 2004 with the original study and 52 herds which showed a well specified plan of from a herd by herd basis and these herds that did this well-specified plan reduced their mastitis rate significantly compared to control herds. We highlight 10 years ago stuff around antibiotic use in low cell count cows at drying off. And actually, if we're putting antibiotic dry cow therapy into low cell count cows at drying off, that appears to increase susceptibility to a coliform mastitis event in the next lactation. And even now, moved on. So uh, Piers Davis and Jamie Lee. Uh, working with Andrew Martin and Simon Archer and, and Richard Eames around strain typing for strep uberus. So we can even now start to look at teasing out for herds with issues with strep uberus, example, uh, are they likely to have 
uh, strains that are more readily transmissible between cows, and that's that's now commercially available. But if you'd said, well, what's the major change in mastitis control in the last 20 years? We would actually say it's moving away from a one-size-fits-all approach. So we shouldn't now be taking very generic approaches, and we know often advice can be quite off the cuff. We tend to sort of say, well, we could try this or we could try that, but it's very generic. And we tend to try and get herds doing the same thing sometimes, a very much a top-down approach. But we know farms and pathogens are very different, so a one-size-fits-all doesn't work. So the major change in mastitis control is to move towards herd-specific. You know, we have to understand herd by herd those control measures that are likely to be important for specific herds at particular times, and work ground up. And this, of course, was one of the key things that came out of the original mastitis control plan research work, the mastitis control plan showed that herds had implemented a control plan specific to them and their pattern of mastitis reduced mastitis rates by 20% in one year. And actually, depending on how compliant they were with some of their actions, they could go better than that. So the research work is done around herd specific. And then you can say, well, mastitis control is simple if we think that infected cows in lactation will cure during the dry period. They are highly likely to cure during the dry period. You know, even for Staphylococcus aureus infections, you know, we are low, a lot of Staph aureuses actually are sensitive to penicillin, only around 15% um, show phenotypic resistance. Uh, and that, that was published at British Mastitis Conference a few years ago. A lot of cows will cure. So therefore the emphasis is absolutely on prevention of new infection. So if we know the emphasis on prevention, when do new infections occur? Where are they coming from? We still perhaps tend to think about other infected cows and the transmission between cows model. So we're quite comfortable with contagious mastitis still. We're assuming infected cows transmit infection to uninfected herd mates. And of course, then we can talk about you know, things around parlor post milking teeth disinfection, segregation of high cell count cows, disinfection of the milking cluster between cows, all good practice, but actually is that going to be important for our herd that's experiencing a mastitis or cell count issue? And also flags up the fact we've tended to perhaps advise around treatment of high cell count cows, and, and perhaps this isn't necessarily now deemed uh, responsible use. And of course, for a lot of herds, it isn't a contagious mastitis issue. In fact, when we looked at you know over a thousand herds between 2009 and 2012 that went through the mastitis control plan with trained vets and advisors, less than 10% of them actually had significant issues with contagious mastitis when you looked at their cell count and clinical mastitis patterns. So really, we talk for the vast majority of herds, it's very environmental. So much more complicated now because you've got issues with environment management throughout the year. And we could be talking about bedding, water, paddocks, loafing space, ventilation, what's going on in gateways, tracks, summer, winter, different groups. It can really be difficult, and, but often still underestimated and perhaps more difficult to elucidate what we need to do when and react accordingly and change things. So it begs the question then if we're going to work with herds, how do we understand what's important on a herd by herd basis? So that brings me then on to the development of Quarter Pro and the pattern analysis tool. Beginning of February 2018, off the back of the rumor stuff at the end of 2017, uh, we um, were fortunate enough to uh, host uh, a meeting at Worcester Rugby Club. We had uh, a lot of uh, organizations present uh, and we wanted to put out there as a dairy sector then if we're now looking to reduce antibiotic use and mastitis remains very important in this you know a discussion question are we going to have some industry-wide coordinated campaign to raise the profile of mastitis control and perhaps consider something we could do alongside the mastitis control plan we had lots of organizations everyone broadly speaking very happy with the mastitis control plan as a gold standard but a desire for a more entry-level scheme you know, the, one of the criticisms of the mastitis control plan is it's quite restricted to people who've been through the training uh, and it's not accessible to farmers. And perhaps could we start with something that was a bit more uh, quick uh, and got us in the right area to get going? 
and then perhaps use the mastitis control plan if we needed to off the back of that. So what is quarter pro? So this, this idea was, was floated. If we want to monitor, understand and improve our health, the first part of any control plan is therefore to understand the pattern. So we need to understand where the majority of new infections are coming from and when they are occurring in the lactation cycle. And we hold up, and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted with some of you online tonight, but we need to start with this. Is it predominantly dry period origin infection or is it not? And therefore it must be lactation based because the controls are clearly going to be very different. And then we could say, well, for a lot of herds, we know it's going to be environmental, but there may be some herds that contagious mastitis patterns are still the predominant issue or maybe an emergent issue with some herds we've come across um, and therefore, again, a different ballgame altogether. But in order to do this, and, and, and you will realise this as much as I do, when we sit down with farmers, we need the data. So we need two things. We need individual cow cell count data. So, for example, I need to know about cow 2240, 102 days in milk, her last few cell counts. So she carved in a low cell count cow here on the 11th of March. She's then remained a low cell count cow, but between the May and the June recording, she's jumped from 20,000 to 3.1 million. Clearly, this is a new infection in lactation. Now, whilst we could talk about what to do with this cow, I'd much rather focus on at what rate are cows like her becoming high cell count? Is there something about May and June where we tend to have a seasonal pattern? Do we do a lot better than this at other times of the year? Uh, what is the new infection rate as measured by cell count in lactation? So that's an example. And of course, that's where we started counting cows on bits of paper and trying to work out rates and set targets. Also, and this is perhaps where it's more difficult, the cell count data tells us half the story. We need the clinical mastitis events to understand the other half. And crucially, things like new clinical cases, it's always about the first clinical case in a lactation cycle. If they're occurring within 30 days after calving, well, then the research is very clear that this is likely to be due to a dry period origin infection. So we really need to be adding this into any pattern analysis the impact of clinical cases, the impact of new clinical cases, and whether or not they occur in the first 30 days. Interestingly, speaking to groups of farmers, still quite a lot of confusion. 30, 60, 100, within the first 30 days is where we would draw the line for likely to be dry period or less likely to be dry period origin. And then we sat down as a, as a group and thought, well, actually, we understand that Data analysis is often a barrier. You know, we know uh, vet time, you know, the pressure on the working day. We need to be able to sit down. We need to have some software. We need to sort of work through this a little bit. Could we automate it? If achieving a pattern is often a bit of a barrier to effective mastitis control on farm, could we automate it? Could we come up with something that did it for us? And then we could quite happily get on with the prevention and move away from some of the things around treatment. Could we make this assessment process very easy. We thought, could we get the herd data from the milk recording organization, download it, convert it, put it into an, a, an analysis tool, and then literally in seconds flat output a pattern. So here we go. So let's run through it. So mastitis uh, quarter pro, let's predict the pattern. So first of all, we need to get a common data layer file. So hopefully um, you're familiar with this. So Farmers, vets, advisors, um, we can go uh, to the milk recording organization. So if you're CIS, NMR or QMMS, all three will make a common data layer file available. In so this is an electronic download. So having downloaded the file, we then need to convert it. So this is what I'm going to show now, just drop out of the presentation. Um, we've done a little YouTube video, so you can find it on this web link here if you haven't already. So we need to download the CDL converter tool. So I'm just gonna uh, go through this process now and we need to load our CDL into it. So I'm just gonna use a CDL uh, from one of my clients down in Glastonbury that I've downloaded from the NMR webpage. And the CDL mastitis data converter will whip through the CDL file, dropping out the cows, calving dates, days in milk, all the cell count data. And we'll start calculating 
some of the metrics that we know are really important to understand the pattern. So when we were chatting with uh, some of the farmers in, in the workshops, for example, we'd say, you know, perhaps thinking about cell count data because, you know, that would be a bit more familiar. Uh, perhaps one of the key things we'd be interested in is what happens to a high cell count cow at drying off and start to calculate an apparent cure rate. So the proportion of cows that have at least one of the last three cell counts prior to drying off above 200, what proportion of those are actually below 200,000 at the first milk recording post calving, for example, would be an important metric to work out. And obviously then the flip side of that, we'd want to have a look at how many cows that were dried off below 200,000 are calving back in above 200,000. So the CDL mastitis data converter is gonna drop all this out and start calculating these metrics. Important, I think we, we sort of tried various different ways of doing this, but in the end, Summit and QMMS went away and wrote this little piece of software. So this is freely available on the HDB webpage. Please do download it and have a go with it if you haven't already. And this will quickly drop out. This is 130 cows block calming herd in Somerset. So we're nearly there now. This will quickly drop out all the metrics we need. And then importantly, before we create our little analysis file, we can also think perhaps we might need to shoehorn in some clinical mastitis events. One of the things that you'll find working with CDL files is we'll have the milk recording data in there, but we might not have the clinical mastitis events. So once we've gone through now, dropped out all the cows, added all the recording data, we can then start thinking about creating the file. So we're nearly ready now. And there we go. Good. So um, Becky won't mind, it doesn't really matter because I'm not gonna show you any data from this farm, but you get the idea that you can see the date of the last recording in your CDL file, the date of the last action. Now, the next thing I know is that Becky tends not to share her clinical mastitis events with the milk recorder. That's fine, she's happy to share it with me. And all we need is the clinical mastitis events in a spreadsheet format, literally date of the case and cow ID. So I'm just gonna merge this on top. So I keep um, Becky's clinical cases in a little spreadsheet. I'm happy to share obviously the spreadsheet with you. Please do pester us, QMMS, Summit, AHDB. It just needs to be in a little format and it needs to be called this. Um, so we'll drop in those clinical cases on top. Important if you're doing this with your clients, please do go further back than 12 months. So get at least 18 months worth of clinical mastitis cases, preferably two years. A, so you can see seasonal patterns, but B, so all cows have had chance to go through a dry period and out the other side. And then finally, we can create our analysis file for the pattern tool. Just think for a minute before we do it, we can either say, well, go from today's date backwards, but this herd, to give you a bit of context, this is an autumn block calving herd. So what I'd really like to do is to have September, October, and November as a three month period of analysis, because I know Becky's gonna be carving a lot of cows here. So for my three months, I'm gonna ask the converter tool to go back from the 30th of November. So I want November, October, September as a three month block. And then we're gonna ask for three months before that, and three months before that, and so on. And we're gonna save this little file in a folder and we'll drop out all these metrics. And as I said earlier, this will be looking at the cell count data and calculating some of these, but also important now that we're going to be including clinical mastitis. For example, the rate of clinical cases in the first 30 days. And for those of you that are familiar with this, remember we set a target of no more than one in 12 cows affected in the first 30 days. We can also look at what happens after 30 days, and also what's quite nice is we can look at even uh, calculating as it is there now, a cure rate for these new cases. And finally, we'll, we'll also look at what happens to heifers. So we'll have a look at heifers carving in. Are they carving in with high cell counts? Are they carving in and developing clinical mastitis in the first month after carving? So once the converter tool has dropped all this out, we're then ready to move across to the pattern analysis tool. 
So once this is finished, well then, there you go, we're done. So I'm just going to remove that now. And now we come to our second piece of software. So again, freely downloadable from the AHDB webpage. This is the pattern analysis tool. And as you can see on the left there, we're looking to uh, have the information about cell count. So yes, we'd like to know the calculated herd average cell count. Yes, we'd like to know about percentage of chronically high cell count cows. But more important than that is some of the metrics that talk about the dynamics of new infections and cures and some of the things around the mastitis, new case rates, dry period origin and so forth. When Catherine and I started playing with this after Andrew and I's original ideas, we started typing this in to play test it. But obviously now we can say we're going to import the file we've just made. There it is, I've just made it using Becky's data. And in a couple of seconds, we've got all the metrics calculated for this herd. And if you note there, we're working backwards from the 30th of November. So we've got the three months ending the 30th, three months before that, three months before that, three months, and so on. So we can see over an 18 month period if the patterns and the metrics are going to be changing. Obviously a table of numbers, it doesn't really mean anything and, and, and we, you know, it's there for reference if we want to refer back, but I'm gonna hit the next button now and we're going to briefly assess the quality of that data. So what I'm gonna be looking for is, have we got essentially three milk recordings every three months? which in this herd we have. We got a flag about beware low numbers of cows calving, but then I'm expecting this. Becky would have carved a few cows sort of back end of August, but then September, October, November, we've really got going with the number of calvings. Carved in a few heifers as well. In smaller herds, obviously, we just gotta be a bit careful with heifer numbers. So if we have you know, a, a dry period new infection rate of 50%, well, that could be one out of two heifers calving in with a high cell count. What you'll find obviously working with CDL files is you may be disappointed about the clinical mastitis cases, in which case you'll have zeros and a red flag, but then we can go back, get the cases into a spreadsheet, rerun the converter tool, merge them in, and then hopefully we have them there. So then finally, we're going to hit the next button here. And this, for those of you that have had a go with this, you're now familiar with, this is the output for the pattern tool. And what we've tried to do here is, is sort of illustrate using a sort of traffic light approach and then write it out. If I'm going to sit down with Becky at the next routine, and in fact, we did this in December, went in for a coffee, ran the pattern tool, Becky sort of saying, well, you know, we've had a few mastitis events. What do I need to do? I can say, well, in the last three months, this is the current sort of pattern. Do we have a contagious mastitis pattern? And therefore, we need to talk you know, more about what's going on in the parlour. Do we have an environmental dry period pattern? And actually the first you know, group of cows that have come through haven't really done very well and have carved in infected, or are we an environmental lactation pattern? So really we're focusing on the top three, first of all, because the top three will be the adult herd and that will drive the predominant current issues. So the top three will give you, relatively speaking, what the current issue is. In terms of then the numbers, this is an arbitrary score and you know, I'm happy to have conversations and actually uh, Bobby Hyde has been using machine learning at Nottingham and we've got a publication imminent in Nature Scientific Reports around this. But what we've tried to do is award points, if you like, based on some of the metrics. So using a dry period cure rate as a nice example, if the dry period cure rate is very poor, you know, and we can't explain that away by some new infection, well, then we're going to put more points in a contagious mastitis, if you like, bin, um, because a very poor dry period cure rate will be one of the hallmarks of a true contagious pattern where we've got a lot of persistent infection. So we're assessing the metrics, awarding points based on are we, you know, better than target or, you know, quite a lot worse than target. So environmental dry period, for example, we'd look at how many cows are calving in and developing clinical mastitis in the first 30 days. So clearly Becky here has done extremely well, very good control of contagious mastitis. The cure rates must be very good. The prevalence of chronic cows must be very low, those sorts of things that you'd look for. So she has a very, very low score and a green dot for contagious in the last three months. She must also have done very well out of the dry period. So these 40 odd cows that have carved in, nearly 50 cows, 
they obviously haven't carved in with high cell counts very often. They haven't carved in and developed clinical mastitis at a high rate. So we're giving her again quite a low score. So relatively speaking, if we were going to spend time with Becky around this area, we'd be talking absolutely about environmental mastitis in lactation. That would be our focus. So it immediately puts us in the right area. And we've written this out here. Interestingly, if you think of a couple of satellite issues, so you might also want to know about the impact of heifers. She's actually got a relatively high score for heifers. So we might, it's not red, so it hasn't come through here in this statement below, but you might have a little chat about heifers perhaps. But the key point is for herd mastitis control, we'd be talking about environmental infection in lactation. The tool is also picking up on some seasonality. Um, so we might want to go back to the raw data and have a little look at this. But what we wanted to achieve was immediately now the advisor, the vet, the farmer would be thinking, right, what is it about my milking cow environment? If you're working with the tool live, you can click here for more information. So we've wanted to put a glossary of terms, for example, so to explain some of the metrics we're using. And scrolling down, we also wanted to start the link between what the patent tool says and where you would go. So if I'm scrolling down to lactating period environment issues, some of the things around uh, control measures that would be important to discuss with the client. So that's the patent tool, and we can save that as a PDF and, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to drop out of that now and go back to the slides. So we've converted our CDL data. We've shoehorned in some mastitis cases if we need to, you know, and that's done via a little spreadsheet. We might have thought about the calving pattern. In this case, they've got, you know, spring and autumn block. We might have thought about key management things, about turnout. When we think about the time frame that we run the analysis file from, we then have got our patent tool and another little YouTube video to accompany it. We dropped in our data and our converted metrics, check the data quality, and then the patent tool says, right, environmental lactation, that's where we need to focus our efforts. Okay, so then step two, we're then going to react to this pattern using resources. So we've been very keen now to say, if you know where the pattern is, can we perhaps drill down and distill some of the key things that are likely to be important? We have our pattern, what next? So for this herd, I'm now going to go back to the Quarter Pro website and you can download now as little PDF bite-sized chunks, if you like, some fact sheets. So I'm going to say, right, Becky, let's have a look at the environmental mastitis in lactation fact sheet. So just to show you what that looks like, I'm gonna drop out of the slides. Here's the fact sheet here. And we've tried to have a few sheets around, it might be cubicles, it might be loose yards, it might be paddocks, cow flow to and from the parlor. But we've tried to do some key things, some key messages that came out of some of the mastitis control plan work. So some of the things around paddocks, loafing space, pre-milking teeth disinfection, those sorts of things. So some handy fact sheets that would accompany it. It's not the full mastitis control plan, and, and we would you know, reassure plan deliverers that actually some of these herds you know, may still need the plan, and we mean to drop into the plan for more detail, but it hopefully puts us in the right area, and we start thinking about some of the control measures that might be important when we have conversations with our clients. Of course, if it's not an environmental lactation, an environmental dry period, well, it's a whole different ball game altogether. We've got a series of fact sheets here around dry cow. We've even got a few YouTube videos, infusion technique for um, intramammary dry cow therapy, for example. And of course, for some herds, we know that contagious mastitis patterns, you know, will still predominate, and therefore we need to be clear on well, for these herds, it absolutely is things around post-smoking teeth disinfection, segregation, cluster disinfection that are important. But of course, for a lot of herds, it won't be. And therefore, the patent tool is what's going to guide us into the right area. So then step three, we're going to do this every quarter. So every three months, we're going to check the pattern, check that we're working in the right area. You know, no point about talking about milking cow cubicle management if three quarters of the new infections are arising from dry cow. You know, we need to be sure we're working in the right area. So we'd urge people, 
grab the CDL file from the milk recording organization, convert the clinical mastitis and cell count data, rerun the pattern tool. Is the pattern changing? Are we, are we still working in this area? Do we still need to focus in that area with our clients? And we're still looking at the predominant pattern. And I stress the word predominant. You know, that we, it won't be 100%, but it's the predominant pattern. Is it dry period? Is it lactation? So what are we trying to do? When infections are predominantly happening, where they're probably coming from, and for most herds, we know this will be environmental, identify the key risk factors with our clients, have those conversations, work out what we could try, make changes and act, and then three months later, we're going to run the patent tool again and go through the whole process. Thank you for bearing with me. I know I've, I've sort of, uh, it's certainly not half an hour, more like 45 minutes. I would like to acknowledge, you know, this is a real team effort, the original concept, you know, very much Andrew Bradley and Martin Green's idea. Catherine and I have sort of play tested and done a lot with some of the original mastitis control plant herds and had a go at seeing what uh, the patent tool made when we compared our notes from herds 10 years ago. Derek Armstrong's led a lot at AHDB with his team there. Pete Down, Chris Hudson, you know, Chris certainly with the patent tool. Bobby Hyde's done a lot now developing the patent tool further, and it's really exciting. Uh, he's now further refined the patent tool with machine learning, and we're now starting to get a sensitivity and a specificity. For example, you know, telling the difference between an environmental and a contagious pattern, we're now in excess of 90%. Telling the difference between a dry period and a lactation pattern is around 80%. So the, the tool is being refined. We're trying to refine the decision-making process. Testing and design then, QLMS and Summit, uh, Nottingham, Mastitis Control Plan Steering Group. We'd like to thank everybody on the steering group, farmers and vets, particularly Rachel Hayton, Ian Onstadt and Tracy Towers uh, being very helpful uh, and helping us with the workshops. So thank you very much for listening. You're happy to take some questions now. Um, and um, yeah, thanks again for coming online. Hi, James. That's great. Thanks so much. That's a brilliant presentation. So now we're going to have some questions. If people would like to um, type some in for James, um, make the most of him being here and online, just whilst we're waiting for a few of those to come in, uh, to remind people that it, the webinar is recorded this evening and I will send everybody the links to uh, the recording on YouTube to be able to watch it. I'll also send the link of the fact sheets that we were talking about, the new Quarter Pro fact sheets. Um, and also there's going to be online on the HDB Dairy website, we've got the mastitis pattern analysis tool. Um, we've also got the, the mastitis cost calculator. Um, and we've also got a full list of all the mastitis plan deliverers um, available on there as well. So I'll send that out to everybody um, after the webinar. So just having a look. Um, now there was, now Sue did ask if you could do a quick repeat of what was needed for the clinical cases, James. Mm. I wonder if you might okay. be able to just do a, a quick recap of that. Of course, so so actually all, all we're working with, and, and some, some people might be uh, familiar with this, um, but we work with a little CSV file. So um, this is the template, if you like, if we're going to have to go back to a herd's diary uh, or software and drop out clinical cases, uh, it needs to be like this. So a date, cow ID, that's all we need really. You, know, you can have severity if you like and which quarter. It needs to be these headings. So it needs to be exactly these headings. It needs to be called this. So so it's easier to email people, you know, the, the spreadsheet template, you know, as, as they need it, then they can keep it, copy it, um, you know, and, and use it as they need. But it needs to be in that format. And I'd stress again, try and get 18 months, preferably two years of clinical mastitis cases, you know, and then keep keep this going. So you're just constantly working down the columns and keep it going. I know a lot of clients, and we have this with workshops, or they've got on-farm software already, and they say, well, look, you know, all our data lives in Uniform Agri, or it lives in Summit Total Dairy, or it lives in C21, or it lives in Interherd. And so uh, the the converter tool only takes CDLs, I'm afraid, because well, a it's free, you know. So you know that's you know that's one of the reasons we you know, we're not going to make it more complicated. 
um, you know, because then we'd have to start charging people, so it's freely available. The other thing is, of course, for a lot of herds, the common data layer for the milk recording organization is still, you know, the probably the most prevalent database out there. Um, that said, if herds have their clinical mastitis cases in Uniform Agri, if you're using the Total Vet software, the Total Vet software will be able to accept Uniform into Herd Summit Westphalia and create the, the, the CSV file you need, if you like, for the patent tool. Um, otherwise, you're into dropping out clinical cases into this little sheet and combining it with the CDL in the converter tool. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question okay. Great, yes, thank you. Right, and then an, another um, comment. So this was a question from Brian earlier on, and he was asking about the carbon cost of mastitis, I guess for farms that are maybe in with um, contracts that are relating to, um, to uh, environmental reports and targets. Right. Is there, have you, you know, anything that you know about that or could put any comments towards? Uh, actually, no, probably. So I'm not. I'm not probably best placed to answer that. Actually, but you know, happy to put it to the group. You know, and if that's something that people want to talk about, the carbon footprint associated, you know, with a mastitis cost. Yes, I mean it's going to be in there, isn't it? But you know, we we came at the need for something like this very much off the back of the antibiotic use agenda. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, question coming from Ben as well. So this was in relation to um, the example uh, with Becky. Yeah. And so he's asked, in the Becky example with the heifers um, scored higher than the EL, early lactation, um, why did you Envi in the program... Sorry, envir play... environmental lactation. Yeah, environmental, environmental, sorry. Lactation. Why yeah. did you in the program play down the heifers as less important um, than well, the EL? Yeah, so good. So I'll, I'll type something as well. We, we're not playing it down as such, and, and perhaps we need to modify the pattern tool slightly so that we distinguish between the top three. So we're saying the impact for the adult herd. So if we're going to talk about mastitis control for the adult dairy herd, is it contagious? Is it environmental dry period or is it environmental lactation? For Becky's example, it's very much environmental lactation. There's also, if you like, a satellite issue of some heifers calving in perhaps with high cell counts, but that's a relatively smaller thing. And, and also that perhaps comes back to the data quality if you remember in Becky's example, there's not actually that many heifers. So if we're looking here, there's only 11 heifers that have calved in that last three month period. So, you know, it's not that we're playing it down. It's just if we're going to focus on the control measures for the adult herd, we're going to be predominantly interested in, is it a contagious pattern, dry period environmental or lactation period environmental? But we are so going to consider perhaps there might be some other influences. I guess the heifers come into it more strongly when it's an environmental dry period pattern. You know, so those herds where it's very much an environmental dry period pattern and the heifers are coming out as well, well, then the role of new infections in heifers probably is more interesting. Um, but we, yeah, we're not playing it down as such. It's just it's perhaps a side issue in terms of the main pattern on farm. I'd also extend that out to the colour of the dots. I know people say, well, you know, it's still only an amber dot, but it's all relative, isn't it? It's relatively speaking, it would still be more than the dry period and contagious. So in Becky's example, even though the environmental lactation score in inverted commas was relatively small, it was, you know, only 50 points, only amber, relative to the dry period and relative to contagious, it still is the key thing. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, question from Helen. So she's asked, if a herd is not milk recording, how do you input calving dates on your clinical mastitis spreadsheet to determine when in lactation mastitis is occurring? Yeah, so here we go with, and, and we, you know, again, we always sort of have this debate about you know, you you can't use this in herds that don't milk record. Therefore, you know, why can't we come up with something for those herds which don't do anything? Well, the answer is actually it's incredibly difficult to do this in herds which do not do any kind of individual cow cell count testing. That said, you can still have some um, quick and dirty, if you like, 
um, back of a piece of paper assessment. So you could go back to these herds and say, right, okay, we we need to sort of in the medium term think about collecting some data, but if we want to get an idea of dry period or lactation, I would always go back to these herds and say, write down the next 12 cows that are going to calf. Do more than one of them get clinical mastitis in the first month? You know, if they do, if it's more than one in 12 getting clinical mastitis in the first month, then we need to use the dry period environmental resource. Or, for example, you could say, right, you're calving a lot of cows now. California mastitis test them four days after calving. And you say, oh, we don't want to do that. And you say, well, milk record them then. But if you don't want to milk record them, California mastitis test at day four, do more than 10% of cows have a positive CMT at day four after calving? Again, if more than 10% are CMT positive, if more than one in 12 are getting mastitis in the first month, use the environmental dry period resource. But then at some point, we have to have the conversation about how we collect some electronic data moving forward because long-term you know, management, long-term monitoring is actually only feasible if we have some individual cow data. Okay, thank you. Uh, one from Brian as well, just asking, would there be any potential benefits to include weather conditions, things like rainfall, temperatures and humidity? Uh, no, no, not with this pattern tool, no. Um, I, I mean, I appreciate these other ways of assessing the impact of environment and the impact of seasonality, perhaps, you know, if we're measuring temperature, humidity index, you know, for example, those are things which we might want to supplement the pattern with. So if the pattern's going to put us in the right area, clearly, you know, and, and you would probably then want to go back to, right, well, I, I might want some more measurements, be they environmental measurements from the housing, or I might want to look at the data in more detail to, to sort of drill down into some of these new cases. Uh, but no, the, the, the patent tool is very much using the cell count and mastitis data to come up with the predominant pattern. What we then do after that, you know, you might want to say, well, perhaps we need some data loggers to understand environmental conditions in the housing, you know, to help us make decisions about fans, ventilation, bedding, you know, those sorts of things, uh, you know, and, and that's where the resources perhaps will help us come up with some other ideas about thinking about control. Okay, great. Um, uh, Pierce and Alex, so you guys have just asked where they can download the tools and watch it again. Sure, so I, I am going to be sending out a link to everything just to let you know. Okay, oh, so okay. it'll either be. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, you got so it there, absolutely. James, on your I, I have, yeah, so, so if everyone can see this, the, it, a lot of this is migrated now onto the new H, AHDB Blue site, and there is a quarter pro um, page, so you can scroll down. Um, I, I think um, Kate Smith might reorganise this a little bit, um, but we've got, you know, uh, apologies about the ridiculous still there, uh, but um, there's some podcasts some studies, but there are then, right, where you get the patent tool and the CDL converter from, some of the YouTube videos, and then the resources at the bottom here, you know, the contagious, the environmental, the dry period. So everything will migrate onto one site. I, I think we probably need to tidy it up slightly. Um, but everything is now available on the Quarter Pro page. Great, thank you. I'll send the link out to everybody. Um, so Ben has asked, could you explain the seasonality output in the pattern analysis tool, please? Mm. Yeah, so uh, what we're looking for is uh, changes in new case rates and new infection rates. Um, so we're looking to attribute a score, again, if you like, a weighted score for changes between three month periods so yes there is a seasonality score um it, it's it, yeah so it doesn't really apply uh to a contagious pattern um but it does apply to the dry period the lactation and the heifers and again in becky's example the heifers actually you know had a big change between sort of three month periods although you could argue that's almost due to the numbers of heifers coming in but we're trying to we're trying to say with the seasonality, do the new case rates and new infection rates vary between three month periods? So again, we can't go any further than flagging up that there appears to be big changes between three month periods. We then absolutely recognise that 
if that is the case, you probably have to go to the raw data, you know, whether you're going to look at this in total vet or Interherd Plus or whatever, or even look at it, you know, sort of in, in a spreadsheet to maybe understand is it summer or winter or around turnout or around housing where, you know, these new case rates or new infection rates alter with just flagging up. It, it helps with the decision making process around environmental versus contagious more than anything else. You know, if there's real variation, again, it adds more points to the environmental boxes, if you like, and moves us away from a contagious diagnosis. I have to say that the sort of the gubbins behind the tool, I appreciate. So a lot of it, you know, Andrew wrote some of the algorithms behind this. Bobby's then taken this on with some of the machine learning. And when we get, so we, we've had some minor amendments in the Nature Scientific Reports paper, but essentially that's now going to be published and some of the methodology is written out in that paper. So we'll be sort of keen to share that. That'll be open access, exactly how the tool is doing some of these things. Okay, brilliant. Right, we haven't got any more questions that have come in now. So, um, James, I just want to say thanks so much. Really great presentation and brilliant demo you, um, of going through it all. Uh, so we will, um, unless there's anything else from you, James, to finish off. No, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming online. I really appreciate it. And um, yes, please do have a go and um, please do give us your feedback. It's really welcome. OK, fantastic. All right. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us and I um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evenings. Uh, take a look at the other webinars that we've got coming up we'll keep you up to date and like I said I'll send you out all the links either tomorrow or Monday so you can take a look at all the resources and re-watch the video okay everybody have a good evening